Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Looks like we really have a full house tonight. Welcome to tonight's lecture, the second event in the Dean's Speaker Series for the academic year. Uh, the Dean Speaker Series was created in order to bring to campus outstanding scholars, outstanding leaders from the fields of business, education, and government to share thoughts and insights with the UNC Keenan Flagler community, the university community, and of course the community at large. And we're always happy to welcome so many members of the community here for these talks. The Dean Speaker Series is made possible through support of the Archie K. Davis Endowment and is managed primarily by our students who do a wonderful job of this, who select and invite the leaders from whom they are most interested in learning. Before I have the privilege of introducing tonight's speaker, I'd like to remind you of our next two speaker events. On January 28th, two, two weeks from tonight, uh, we will welcome Koki Roberts, noted political commentator, author, and NPR contributor as this year's Weatherspoon lecturer. So that's two weeks from tonight. And then on February 25th, we'll be pleased to welcome Jason Kyler, founder of Hulu and a 1993 BSBA and journalism school graduate of UNC Keenan Flagler. And he will be our final Dean speaker for the academic year. We'll be sharing more about these events as the dates approach, and I hope you'll be able to join us then. So again, that's January 28th for Cookie Roberts and February 25th for Jason Kyler. At the conclusion of this evening's lecture, Larry Chavis, Assistant Professor of Strategy and Entrepreneurship, will offer a vote of thanks to our speaker on behalf of our faculty, staff, and students. And before I introduce this evening's speaker, I'd like to welcome some special guests. Uh, first of all, a very special welcome to all of the PNG employees and former employees who are joining us, many of whom are UNC Keenan Flagler or UNC graduates. So welcome to all of you from the PNG community. Uh, also with us tonight is Joe Simone, the director of the Keenan Institute, uh, Judith Cohn, special assistant to the Chancellor for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Judith, we're happy to have you with us, as well as, and I did see him, Dr. Myron Cohen, UNC Associate Vice Chancellor for Global Health. Glad you could make it as well, and also the co-Tar Heel of the Year. Congratulations for that, Mike. And of course, we extend a special welcome to former Dean of UNC Keenan Flagler, Jack Evans, and his wife. Welcome to you as well and many other special special guests and members of the community. This is uh, one of the, the best nights of the year is when we're able to welcome so many alums, so many friends, so many students and faculty uh, to hear a, a wonderful speaker such as Bob McDonald. So tonight we are honored to welcome Bob back to UNC Keenan Flagler. And I say back because Bob was kind enough to speak to our graduating MBA students not so long ago and was doubly generous to be willing to come back and speak with us this evening. As you most certainly know, Bob is the chairman of the board, president, and chief executive officer of Procter & Gamble. When Bob became CEO in July of 2009, he reaffirmed the company's commitments to its purpose, which is to touch and improve the lives of the world's consumers through branded products of superior quality and value. The company's growth strategy is focused on winning with customers, winning with consumers through innovative, superior performing products that improve the lives of consumers around the world every day. And if, if you're not that familiar with P&G, you'll be astonished by the absolute uh, spread and uh, depth of exactly that last statement. Under Bob's leadership, P&G has grown sales by an average of about 4% per year over the past three years. He is a champion of global trade and economic growth and currently is chair of the US-China Business Council. He's also vice chair of the Business Roundtable and serves on the Foreign Investment Advisory Council in Russia and the Singapore International Advisory Council of the Economic Development Board. So he is a busy guy. This evening, and we're very happy about this, a portion of Bob's remarks will be devoted to PNG's environmental and social responsibility programs, including the Clean Drinking Water Partnership that PNG has with the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So please join me in giving a warm Tar Heel welcome to Bob McDonald. Thank you so much, Jim. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, wonderful to be back here at Chapel Hill and uh, to be back with uh, my P&G colleagues who, uh, who are graduates of this great institution. Uh, what I wanted to talk about tonight is the growth opportunity that's ahead of us, uh, not just as a company, but also as, uh, as any company 
that operates uh, around the world. But before I do that, let me start with the history of our company. We were founded in 1837 in Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, by two gentlemen, not surprisingly, Procter and Gamble. What you may not know is they were introduced by their father-in-law. They started dating uh, sisters, and it was the father-in-law that uh, introduced the two gentlemen. They made products, one made soap, one made candles, and the raw materials and byproducts of those two products are synergistic, so they decided in 1837 to form a partnership. And uh, that was 175 years ago, and in October of last year, we celebrated our 175th birthday. Uh, that means we're older than most countries in the United Nations. Uh, and we're one of uh, just a handful of companies uh, that are 175 years old. So we think of ourselves not only as a company, but we think of ourselves as an institution, an institution that all of us want to strengthen over time to continue to play an important role in the world uh, today. Our purpose as a company, since we formed the company in 1837, is to, uh, is, as Jim said, is to provide branded products and services to, uh, uh, to meet the needs, improve the lives of the world's consumers. We take that very seriously. Uh, most of us join the company because of that purpose. We want to make a difference in the world, and we know that we can do that through the products and services that the Procter & Gamble company offers. We also have a strong set of values that describe our company. Uh, we're one of the few companies uh, in the world that only promotes from within. That's why we spend so much time uh, on college campuses, because that tends to be the place where we get most of our new hires. And uh, I myself spend, uh, usually I try to be on a college campus about once every quarter, once every three months or so, somewhere in the world, talking to new students about Procter & Gamble. Our I-5 values are integrity. We uh, don't lie, cheat, steal. We don't tolerate people who do. Leadership, we expect every employee to be a leader. Leadership is an activity, a behavior. It's not a position or a title. Ownership, every Procter & Gamble employee owns company stock, and, uh, and we have a high percentage. Uh, almost 10% of our stock is owned by company employees and retirees. Uh, ownership, uh, I just talked about that. Passion for winning, uh, we want to win, we want to beat competition. Trust, we trust each other uh, unconditionally, and uh, that helps us work together in an efficient fashion. This purpose, values, and principles undergirds everything that we do. It's the foundation of our work. It describes our culture no matter where you go in the world. Well, as I said, we're 175 years old. Uh, we're about $84, $85 billion in sales. We're in over 180 countries around the world. We reach about 4.6 billion consumers a year. On any given day, there's over 4 billion people who use at least one Procter & Gamble product. It varies from the United States, where we've been for 175 years. In the United States, the average American spends over $90, $95 a day. I'm sorry, a year, not a day. I wish it were a day. <laughs> spends about $95 a year on Procter & Gamble products to a place like uh, China, where we're the largest consumer goods company in China. We do about $6 billion of business a year, but the average Chinese consumer only spends $3 a year on Procter & Gamble products. And we have 25 brands that do a billion dollars or more in sales a year around the world. Uh, our biggest brand is Pampers. Pampers does about $10 billion in sales every year. As you can imagine, the Pampers brand manager gets a lot of attention from all of us. Our business objectives are very straightforward. Number one, we want to win with consumers at the first and second moments of truth. We consider the first moment of truth is when that consumer is in a store, in front of a shelf, or online, looking uh, at the product offering online. We try to win that consumer moment, have that consumer buy the product. The second moment of truth is when they buy that product and take it home and use it, or it, it's delivered if they buy it online, they use that product at home, we want to win that moment of truth, meaning that they will like the experience and come back and buy the product. The second objective 
is deliver total shareholder return in the top third of our peer group. That's to make sure that our shareholders uh, are happy with the return that they get on their money. And we think about all the money uh, we spend uh, as if it's shareholder money. Uh, we tend to buy back our stock every year, four to six billion dollars, and we tend to spend about uh, four to six billion dollars a year on dividends, returning cash uh, to our shareholders. Our strategies uh, are, are very simple and they're, and they're designed to get us focused. Uh, if you take all the product categories we're in around the world, which are about 36, across all the countries we're in around the world, which is about 180, you end up with about 1,000 category country combinations. We focus on those 40 most important category country combinations. They're places where our business is the largest and it's the most profitable. We also focus on our 20 biggest innovations. Innovation is one of our strengths. It's also our lifeblood. The primary way we improve people's lives is by innovating new products and new categories and making their lives easier and simpler uh, through that innovation. So every year we pick our top 20 innovations, those that deliver the highest net present value when they're expanded, and we make sure all the resources of the company are dedicated to making those 20 innovations big. And then last but not least is our 10 biggest developing markets. Uh, developing markets is where the growth will occur in the future, and we make sure that our plans are sufficient in those developing markets in order to grow and build market share. Let me go into a little bit more detail. So these top 40 category country combinations comprise 50% of our sales and 70% of our profits. You can see that they're much more important than the balance uh, that we're not focused on. About 20, per, 20 of them, or 50%, are in our household care business area, that's laundry detergent, uh, home care, fabric care, so forth. And about 20 of them are in our beauty and grooming area, which would be hair care, uh, skin care, cosmetics, and so forth. Uh, the fact that they ended up about 50% in each is, is more of an accident than anything else, but it gives good balance to our corporation. 20 largest innovations, uh, two examples of those are Tide Pods. I don't know if you've been shopping for laundry detergent recently, but I know college students really like Tide Pods uh, because they're very simple to use. You can put them in the machine, you don't have to measure, there's no mess, and your clothes come out cleaner than they ever would before. I know uh, from the work I've done on various college campuses, if, if, if uh, the students don't have time to wash their clothes with Tide Pods, they may use Febreze and simply wash their clothes without washing them. <laughs> and Febreze is a good product for that, so I don't want to discourage you from using the product for that reason. But Tide Pods is a new innovation already. Uh, we launched it uh, late last year. It's up to a 7% share of market. It's got over 70% of the market in single dose, and we're in the process now of expanding it uh, around the world and to other brands. Another example of an innovation is our sponsorship of the Olympics. Uh, we've signed an agreement with the International Olympic Committee where we uh, work together to, uh, to use the Olympics as a platform in order to, to sell Procter & Gamble products around the world and also to make people aware of the Procter & Gamble company. And uh, the London Olympics was really the first global execution of this we had almost 40 athletes uh, from the United States. We were almost in every country around the world, uh, and we, uh, we were the largest sponsor of the Olympics that, uh, that the Olympic effort has ever had. In terms of the developing markets, you can see here I've listed uh, four of our largest developing markets, what most people refer to as the BRIC countries. And you can see we've enjoyed uh, great growth in these countries, anywhere from 17 to 27 percent. Uh, we're the largest consumer goods company in China, the largest consumer goods company in Russia. We entered India and Brazil late, but we're growing at a very fast pace as we're bringing in more categories and, uh, and more new brands. Uh, but developing markets have been growing about uh, over 14 percent uh, a year for us over the last decade and we want to keep that up. The reason we want to keep it up is we have a disadvantage today. Uh, the Procter & Gamble company has 38% of its sales in developing markets. 
that's a disadvantage because the developing markets are economically growing faster than developed markets. Our competition, Colgate, Unilever, have 40 to upwards of 40 and 50 percent of their business in these markets. So any given quarter, if we grow the same amount, they get a two index point advantage on top line growth. We've got to overcome that. So we're investing to grow our footprint in developing markets uh, in order to expand further. We have about uh, 10, 15 factories under construction right now. All of those are in developing markets as we try to grow. Now, having said the disadvantage, or excuse me, 38% is a disadvantage, the advantage of that is 38% of 85 billion is 32 billion. So we're, we're larger in total, in absolute, 32 billion dollars in sales in developing markets. That's larger, uh, but it's almost three times larger than the entire Colgate company. But the percentage is a, is a disadvantage that we're working hard to overcome. Why are developing markets important? It's very simple, that's where the growth is. Uh, the world population is going to grow by 800 million people by the year 2020. 95 percent of the growth is going to be in developing markets. Uh, and, and many of those people, one and a half billion people, will be entering the middle class by 2020. We have to be present in those markets. Uh, one of our fastest growing businesses right now is Pampers, our baby care business. And uh, we're installing a new baby diaper line, new production line, somewhere in the world every three and a half weeks. And we don't see that stopping. And most of those lines are going into places like Asia and Africa. But what I wanted to focus on tonight, since I can't uh, talk about the entire world and the time I've, I've, I have, is I want to talk about Sub-Saharan Africa, which uh, to me is the new growth adventure for any company in the world. In 1991, the management of the Procter & Gamble Company came to me and said they'd like me to move to the Philippines. And the reason was, was to go to Asia to get experience in the fastest growing part of the world at that time. 1991, I spent 10 years in Asia, from 1991 to 2001, four years in the Philippines, six years in Japan, but I had responsibility for parts of our business all over Asia. And that was the growing part of the world at that time and still is growing very fast today. Africa today reminds me of Asia in 1990. It reminds me of, of, of the, the way that countries were poised for takeoff and, uh, and I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of economic growth and a lot of people entering the middle class, particularly in sub-Sahara Africa. So let me talk a little bit about our experience so far. We're actually late coming to Africa. Most of our competitors uh, have been there before we have. Um, many of our competitors uh, started in countries where they colonized the world. The United States didn't really colonize anywhere other than the Philippines briefly after the Spanish-American War. And as a result, we're late in getting to many of these, many of these countries. But, uh, but Africa is really important for us. It's, it's important as, because it's big, it's important because it's growing, and it's important because it's dynamic, where we see a lot of uh, movement within uh, economic uh, tiers within the country. We first entered uh, with, two, with three of our biggest brands, Pampers, which is uh, baby diapers, Always, which is a feminine hygiene product, and Ariel, which is a laundry detergent. Think of Ariel as you think of Tide in the United States. Uh, in parts of Europe and Africa and Asia, we have Ariel, which is just, uh, it's the same formula as Tide, uh, but a different brand name. Then we entered with Duracell, which is our, our personal power business. Uh, power is really the big issue uh, around the world. If you've read Tom Friedman's books, um, uh, Hot, Flat, Crowded, and other books, he talks about power is going to be the key. I mean, you can't work your, your cell phone, your smartphone, or your personal computer unless you have power. And uh, power is going to be critical. I've been in parts of Africa where I'll be meeting with a chieftain in a, of a tribe where there is no electricity in the village, and their cell phone will go off. And, uh, you know, obviously they're getting the power from somewhere. So power becomes very important. We also enter with Gillette, uh, which is obviously a shaving uh, regimen. And now we're launching right now Oral-B, which is toothpaste and a tooth care regimen. Uh, here in the United States, think of uh, we have Oral-B toothbrush. We have Crest toothpaste, Crest rinse. 
but uh, around the world where we're introducing it new, we've gone with the Oral-B brand name rather than the Crest brand name. And then Safeguard, Safeguard Soap, which is an important product because it de-germs, it uh, kills germs. And uh, germ, passing germs is a big issue in, uh, in these markets. So that's the growth plan that we've been on and that we're currently on. Uh, let me briefly talk about how we launched Ariel. When we launched Ariel in Sub-Saharan Africa, we had the idea that Ariel removes in one wash what other detergents can't remove in multiple washes. And that was the way we sold it. We went village to village to do in-store, to do uh, village demonstrations. And you can see an example here uh, of where we would actually go into a village, uh, hire people. They would do a demonstration, side-by-side -side demonstration with the leading brand at that time. And because of that effort, we were able to take over market leadership. Another example is always. Uh, I was in Nigeria uh, a few months ago. I went to a high school. Uh, we work with um, uh, the Ministry of Education in Nigeria. We go into high schools. We teach about female uh, menstruation. We teach about uh, how we have a product uh, to solve menstruation. We teach about menstruation being a natural thing. And because of that, we're actually able uh, to keep girls in school. When Nigeria, they developed some advertising and an idea, an insight, called up to eight hours where you don't have to check for a stain. And, uh, and that idea now is going uh, all over the world. But, uh, but it was a great, great campaign that was developed uh, in Nigeria. Pampers, uh, Pampers, as I said, is our fastest growing and our largest brand. Uh, it's very interesting, when we introduced Pampers into some of the countries in Africa, we couldn't get mothers to use it. Uh, when you can't afford uh, a disposable diaper for every usage occasion, you tend to use a disposable diaper uh, overnight for the convenience of the mother being able to sleep while the baby, uh, be, be able to sleep while the baby sleeps throughout the night. And what we discovered though is that mothers wouldn't do that. Uh, as you all know, mothers are selfless and they won't do something that's convenient for them. So we had to do some clinical research where we discovered that the baby that wore Pampers slept throughout the night. They got what we call golden sleep or one dry night. And babies who sleep throughout the night develop better than those babies who wake up every four hours when they urinate or defecate. So this positioning, this 12 hours of dryness, this Pampers night is one dry night, has led to market leadership in places like Nigeria uh, and South Africa, where it's all about the development of the baby. As I said, we're building a, a lot of factories uh, throughout the developing market world. Uh, right now, we're building a, a factory in Lagos, Nigeria. It's about a $100 million investment. We'll employ uh, hundreds of people, and uh, it will be producing uh, disposable diapers, Pampers disposable diapers, by the year 2014. You may be wondering about our factories. I, I, should, I should mention this. Uh, uh, the U.S. government always talks about the importance of exports, uh, but obviously if you're making a disposable diaper, it's hard to make a disposable diaper in Mahoopany, Pennsylvania, and export it to Lagos, Nigeria, and make any money off of it. So our factories have to be near the consumers that they serve. So we don't export much, and we don't import much. Our factories and our raw material sources have to be in country. Well, with the purpose of, um, of touching and improving lives, I tried to show earlier how we do that through our brands, but we also try to make sure our brands have an aspect of social responsibility, or we as a corporation have an aspect of social responsibility, where we go into a market and we do good as well as trying to do well financially. Uh, one example of this is, is on our Pampers business, where we care for the healthy development of babies. I talked about a golden night of sleep uh, one of the things we do is we partner with UNICEF. And through that partner with UNIC partnership with UNICEF, every time somebody in the world buys a package of Pampers, we work with UNICEF to vaccinate a mother and a baby against neonatal tetanus. Uh, neonatal tetanus kills about 70,000 mothers and children a year. And by, using, by working with UNICEF, we've been able to protect 100 million women and babies and we've actually eliminated the disease, neonatal tetanus, from eight countries in the world. And at the current rate of growth of the Pampers business, 
we're expecting we'll eliminate neonatal tetanus from the earth by the year 2015. And after we do that, we'll move on to another disease that affects mothers and babies. We also have um, Pampers Mobile Clinics in many parts of the world. Uh, I was in Egypt uh, about a year ago uh, going around the Nile Delta in a van. And uh, on the van, we had uh, trained uh, pediatric nurses and, uh, and physician's assistants. And uh, we would go into a village. And uh, because it was, it was marked Pampers, uh, we had distribution on Pampers in these Nile Delta areas. Mothers would come out. And that was the only time during the childhood of their children that their children would see a doctor or a pediatric trained nurse. So what we try to do is care about the healthy development of babies, not just their diapering, but also uh, in, in multiple ways and give out free health advice. So far, we've reached about 8 million mothers, and we have more work to do. Another example is always. Um, I was talking a little bit about this uh, earlier in Nigeria. Uh, one of the problems in many parts of the world is they don't have the right feminine hygiene products, and many cultures don't understand that menstruation is a natural, a natural process. So what happens in many of these countries is the girls, when they menstruate, don't go to school. And you can imagine if, if you're uh, not going to school one week of every month, uh, on average it takes about three months and the girls drop out of school. So you go into a school where the children are, are older than menstruation age and you find out they're all boys. And you say, what's going on here? Why don't the girls go to school? Well, this is part of the issue. So what we do is we go in, we teach about menstruation, we provide the product, and because of that we've been able to keep uh, 720,000 girls in school in 20 different countries who would have otherwise dropped out of school and, uh, and not gotten their education. So it's, it's really critical that we do this work. And we do this work partnering with governments so that um, we're not just trying to, to change the social norms of the country, but we're trying to help the government change the social norm and, and frankly, get more productive 50% of their population that they're, that they're losing. Uh, our signature program is probably our Children's Safe Drinking Water Program, which, uh, as Jim talked about, which we do with the University of North Carolina. Uh, we have these packets uh, called, uh, they were called Pure. We've rebranded them Procter & Gamble or P&G. Uh, these packets purify 10 liters of water in 20 minutes. Over 2,000 children die a day from drinking unsafe water. That's a travesty. It's a tragedy and a travesty. It doesn't have to happen today. You know, I've been in many parts of the world where I'll be upstream and there'll be a water buffalo, a carabao, as they call it in the Philippines, defecating or urinating in the water. You go downstream, and you see a young boy with a bucket, or a, a young, young girl with a bucket, collecting water from a pipe that's sticking out of a concrete barrier. They don't know where the water came from. And they look at the, the water, and they think it looks clear. They have no idea that there are viruses and bacteria in that water. And so children die. And that, we think that's unnecessary. So we invented uh, this technology, uh, pure uh, P&G uh, purifier of water technology, which will clean up dirty water in 10 minutes. And uh, one of the leaders of that program is, is Dr. Greg Allgood, who's a graduate of, uh, of UNC. In fact, Greg uh, wanted to be with us tonight, but he's right now on his way down from Mount Kilimanjaro in, uh, in Africa. Uh, where he has taken a group of celebrities in order to raise money for this project. So far, we've, uh, we've cleaned up five and a quarter billion liters of water. Um, we've saved uh, more than 215 million days of diarrhea. Uh, we've saved more than 28,000 lives, and uh, we're, we've done it in 65 countries. We work with over 100 aid agencies around the world who help us do this, because we don't necessarily have people on the ground in every one of these countries. Uh, and the goal I set when we were together at the Clinton Global Initiative a few years ago was by 2020, we want to save one life every hour. And to do that, we basically have to do 2.5 billion liters of water uh, every, every year. Uh, to do that, we've tripled the production of our plant in uh, Pakistan, and we've built a new plant in Singapore, which we're dedicating uh, very shortly. 
in order to be able to do that. Uh, this partnership with UNC is really terrific. We, we couldn't do this uh, by ourselves. Uh, your focus on uh, water uh, in our world is, is really important. The work you do in the Institute for Global Health and Infectious Disease uh, and all these different organizations, and even including the journalism school, have been partners with us in, in making this happen. Uh, I'd like to show you a vid video that shows uh, some of the work that we've been doing. Please watch. UNC did something unprecedented. It adopted a campus-wide theme for two years to make a difference on a major global challenge. And the theme was water. As a UNC alumni, I know how critical the work that the university does is in clean drinking water. P&G is working with the business school, Moorhead Scholars, the journalism school, and the medical school in order to provide clean drinking water to help thousands of people across Malawi. As we try and do HIV testing and other healthcare measures, to people living in communities in Malawi, we also talk to them about clean water, offer the packages, the education necessary to use them properly, and that's making a contribution to better health. Our students have a sincere interest in trying to make a difference, and you quickly realize that water is just one of the key issues having to do with quality of life. Learning what it's actually like to work in a resource poor country, understanding the people that are here, and seeing how dedicated the people are that work at this hospital every day, it's been amazing. So the collaboration with PNG means that those students can go into the field, they can become engaged in projects, they can support implementation work, that actually makes a difference to people's lives. This year we announced a, uh, a partnership with Smokey Robinson uh, to raise awareness of this effort and to get more people on board, donating more money, getting more people involved so we could provide more pure, uh, more PNG packets to purify water in more places around the world. And uh, we asked Smokey to, to uh, we're, we're sitting together here at the Clinton Global Initiative uh, this year, we asked Smokey to, uh, to talk to you briefly uh, about Smoke Alarm. Please watch. Hi, I'm Smokey Robinson. And as you may know, I'm working with some of my friends to create a digital emergency broadcast network for good called Smoke Alarm. We're aggregating hundreds of millions of Twitter and Facebook followers and friends to empower them to act and address specific social issues. And I believe one of the most basic needs is clean water. Nearly 4,000 kids a day die needlessly because the only thing their parents can find for them to drink is full of parasites and disease. But there is hope and a way for each and every one of us to make a real difference. My friend, President Bill Clinton, introduced me to Procter & Gamble. They make these water purification packets, which work like a miracle to make dirty water clean enough to drink. You add a packet to dirty water, stir for just five minutes, let the water settle, then you strain the water through a cloth, and you have clean drinking water in only 30 minutes. You can get these packets into the hands of people who need them. To join us for this and other smoke alarms, simply donate your Twitter or Facebook social media feeds. When we sound the alarm to raise funds, your voice will amplify the alarm so more people will hear it and more people will act. Sign up now at smokealarm.org. Thanks. Smokey's a great partner. He, uh... He really wants to do, do good, and he wants to use his uh, abundant reputation and celebrity in order to make a difference in the world, and he's really taken this on. Um, and I know the time we spent together, I'm sure we're going to do uh, even more together in the future. Well, as I said, uh, uh, Greg Allgood, who you saw in the video, couldn't be with us tonight because he's up on the summit. Uh, and this is the, the, the idea of climbing Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa. Uh, the highest peak in Africa, uh, was designed to drive awareness and to get attention to uh, what we're trying to do to uh, provide more and more drinking water and eliminate those deaths that occur from people drinking uh, unclean water. If you'd like to get involved and you're on Facebook, uh, please go on Facebook and 
watch the video and please give us a like because uh, every like is one packet of water that, uh, that we'll donate, which is another 10 liters of clean drinking water. So if you're on Facebook, please, please visit uh, PG. Uh, children's Safe Drinking Water. And so what we're trying to do in Sub-Saharan Africa is to improve lives, accomplish our purpose, improve lives through our brands, through our business growth, employing people in our factories, and through our social responsibility. And as you can see, as a company with a purpose of touching and improving lives, there's a tremendous intersection between what we do in our brands, like Pampers, what we do in our social responsibility, like eradicating neonatal tetanus, and what we do through employing people in our factories, as we will in the factory that we're building in Lagos. So it, it all comes together, and it's all about that purpose. If you're interested in, uh, in joining our team and being part of the Procter & Gamble company, uh, would the Procter & Gamble people please raise their hands? Look around. If you see a hand up, uh, these are people who uh, would be happy to talk to you about the Procter & Gamble company. Uh, and we've got people here who are involved in recruiting here at, at UNC. We'd love to talk to you. Or you can visit us on any of these social media sites, uh, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn. That completes my, uh, my remarks. If there are any questions or comments, if we have time, I'd be happy to, to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments or reactions over anything I talked about? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> well, we still recruit at Cornell. I was at Cornell uh, last year, uh, speaking in uh, in the John. I think it's called the Johnson Museum, Johnson Center, Johnson Museum. Um, Cornell is a great school for us. And uh, let's see, 60 years ago, I'm trying to think. When I joined Procter and Gamble in 1980. We were a $10 billion company, so that was uh, 32 years ago. Uh, probably 60 years ago, we must maybe, well, less than a billion. So it's, it's amazing uh, what happens over time. Actually, you're probably wondering this, but 32 years ago when I joined the company, uh, the share price of a share of Procter & Gamble stock, any guesses? Today it's about $69, $70. Any guesses what it was in 1980? $2.32. $2. I was leaving the United States Army. I didn't have any money, so I didn't own any stock. Yes, sir. Sure. That's a great question. You know, we were, we were um, I was actually discussing this earlier um, with the, the head of the MBA program. I think the, the, you know, to be a globally effective leader is very different than to be a leader who's effective in your own country and your own culture. And the number one thing I think that you, that you need to develop or have is empathy. Empathy. And ironically, not, maybe not ironically, but there's tremendous, for us there's tremendous congruence with our business. If, if we don't have empathy as a consumer goods company, uh, we won't win. What do I mean by that? Well, if you want to innovate, whenever I go to a market, one of the first things I do is I go into a consumer's home and I watch them use our products. And no consumer is going to tell you, for example, when, when consumers are riding horse, when people are riding horses, they're not going to say, I need an automobile because the automobile wasn't invented yet. So nobody's going to tell me exactly what they need. But I have to have enough empathy where I can understand what they need and then try to design it. So my recommendation 
uh, what we do in the development of our leaders is we make sure we put them in foreign countries and we tell them to learn the language, learn the culture. Now, what, why is that important? Um, I spent six years in Japan. And every country I lived in, uh, I've tried to learn the language and learn the culture. And you might say, well, why is it important to know the language uh, in Japan? Um, languages represent cultures. When I was in the Army, uh, in the 82nd Airborne Division, not, not too far from here at Fayetteville, and I went to the Arctic for Arctic warfare training, I discovered that Inuits or Eskimos had many different words for ice and snow. Makes sense, right? If you're going to ride a dog sled over a frozen lake, you'd kind of like to know how deep that ice is before you take the dog sled on the lake. Well, imagine today I appoint you the general manager of our skincare business in Japan. And you may say, well, why is it important that I know the language? And I tell you that isn't it uh, unusual that the word in Japanese for interesting is omoshiloi, or omoshiloi, the word omoshiloi in Japanese, which means interesting. It's two Chinese characters. Uh, in Jap Japanese, you have three alphabets. You have a hiragana for Japanese words, katakana for foreign words, and kanji, or Chinese characters, uh, for ideas. And this word interesting is two Chinese characters. Omo, or those of you who speak Chinese will be able to read this too. The omo on the left-hand side means face. Shiloi on the right-hand side means white. So why is the word in Japanese uh, white face? Why is the word for interesting white face? Yeah, gaijin, yeah. I, actually, it's interesting. Uh, when I say that to my Japanese friends, I'll say, you know what? I never thought about that. Which also shows you the power of taking somebody outside the culture and bringing them into the culture. So I don't know why the word interesting is white face, but oftentimes the response I get is, well, um, geishas paint their face white. OK, well, why do geishas paint their face white? White skin's a symbol of beauty. OK, why is white skin a symbol of beauty? Again, I don't know the answer. But my hypothesis is that white skin's a symbol of beauty because uh, in Asia, most of the societies developed around rice paddies. Those who worked in the rice paddy got dark skin. Those who were in deep in the castle uh, had light skin. So light skin became a symbol of wealth, position, uh, and beauty. Um, so why is that important? Well, uh, Japan is one of the largest skincare markets in the world, uh, about $9 billion in sales. And uh, guess what the number one selling product is? Skin whitening. Right. Now, if you go to Western Europe or North America, think about this a minute. <laughs> so I say, to, I say to my friends, OK, you go to Western Europe, North America, what sells there? Skin darkening. I say, OK, all right. <laughs> Why? Why? Right? Why? And, and you know what they say? Well, you remember the Japanese read from right to left, and the Americans read from left to right. <laughs> no, not exactly. Not exactly. But maybe it's because uh, I remember back uh, to my kindergarten class. I lived in Gary, Indiana when I was growing up. We didn't have much, uh, much money. We didn't go on vacation. But after the holidays, my teacher would do a very, what I thought was a very rude thing. She said, uh, write a paper on where you went on vacation over your holidays. And of course, I never went on vacation because we, we couldn't afford to. We stayed in town, and our grandparents were in town. And uh, those kids who had dark skin, had been to Florida or other places, uh, could write beautiful, beautiful papers about their adventures. So in, in a way, the same phenomenon, but just in reverse. They were able to get dark skin. So uh, that's why empathy becomes so critical, I think. Thank you. It was a great question. Other? Yes, sir. Yeah, good question, good question. Everybody here, can you, can you all hear the question? What do you do to, to uh, analyze the stability of governments? We use um, risk-adjusted uh, interest rates uh, when we think about the cost of capital and other things. 
and we generally use the risk-adjusted interest or risk-adjusted cost of capital that uh, most of the banks would uh, would ascribe to. But I think your question is a, is a good one because it also brings up to me one of my responsibilities, which is I have to find ways to work with governments to partner with them, um, with with a government with a purpose of touching and improving lives. I can generally always get the government to agree with me that that's what we're trying to do. What we probably might disagree on on sometimes is how to do it, but we can agree on that. So what we do is we work with governments to try to try to find common approaches to things, and we try to help them improve the lives of their people. But we do have to be careful about the stability of government. We're, we've been around longer than most governments. We plan to be around longer than most governments. And um, so, we, so we try to manage for the long term. Yes, sir. You probably couldn't hear a question back, so I'll repeat. In, in uh, the developing markets we're in, how do we think about the role of religion, uh, and in, particularly as it relates to, uh, to our business in the Middle East? Um, as I was describing empathy, religion is, is a piece of the culture, and we have to understand that. So um, when, when I was in Japan, uh, I spent a lot of time studying the culture. And one of the things I discovered, I give you another example in Japanese. Nihongo anashite imasu ka? I just seeing if anybody spoke Japanese. Ah, good. Uh, the word for beautiful. Okay, I, I couldn't hear you. But the word for, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, the word for kirei. 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 There was an article in The Economist magazine in about uh, 1995 or so that said the Japanese people, uh, in Japan, cleanliness isn't next to godliness. Cleanliness is godliness. The word kirei in Japanese means beautiful and it means clean at the same time. So why is that? I don't, again, I don't know. I don't know. And, and maybe this gentleman who's Japanese can help us. But the Japanese used to have, uh, well, uh, be prior to World War II, the religion was the Shinto religion. If you go to a Shinto shrine, you have something called a mizubachi. It's a, it's, a, it's a place where you take water, you wash your hands, you wash your mouth. Everything is about cleanliness. You go into a Japanese home, you never wear shoes in a Japanese home. You put on slippers. When you go to the restroom, you put on a separate set of slippers because the germs in the house, the germs outside the house can't get in the house, and if they get in the house, they, you don't want to take the bathroom germs out of the bathroom. The Japanese homemaker washes the laundry of the children and uh, the mother separately from the father because they don't want to wash with outside germs. Now, a lot of that comes from the Shinto religion and the focus on purity. If you buy a new car in Japan, you take it to the Shinto shrine, and the priest blesses it with a, a white wand. Now, so that's all part of the culture. Why is that important? Well, in 1998, no, let's see. I'm sorry, I might get my years mixed up. About 1998, we invented a new chemistry that allowed us to um, put a, um, a color-safe bleach in laundry detergent that didn't need the kinetics of hot water in order to work. It was an activated bleach through the chemistry. And we we're trying to figure out how do we sell that. And one of the unique properties of that bleaching detergent was it would not only get the clothes cleaner than anything else, but it would kill all the germs. So when we sold it in Japan, we said, you know, this is so good, it not only cleans the clothes, but it kills all the germs. And the, the brand just took off. It was Ariel there. So again, back to empathy, knowing the culture, knowing the religion makes a difference in what we do. How do I think about the Middle East? Um, we have a big business in the Middle East. Uh, we're the number one company in generally most of the countries in the Levant, in the northern part of Africa, in the Near East. Um, we have a big operation in Egypt. Um, and uh, you know, the way I think about it is change is occurring. 
and we need to be part of the discussion on how that change should occur. Our employees are certainly part of it, and we do everything we can to protect them uh, if there's a disruption and to make sure they have jobs and to make sure that we continue our business. Uh, there's a, a man in Morocco. Do you have the Ferris video? I want to show you this story. When we think about touching and improving lives, it takes place with our products, it takes place with our philanthropy, but it also takes place with the people who work for us. Watch this video. This is from Morocco. Billboard on the front here. Thank <laughs> happens a lot in, uh, in areas of the world where there is no economy. Uh, literally, we can take a Procter & Gamble van that's uh, run by one of our distributors, open the back door of the van, and you've got multiple product categories that meet people's needs and can create an economy where one doesn't exist. In this particular case, Mr. Ferris was hired. At the beginning, you may have noticed he, he had a, a disabled leg, uh, was not married, and didn't have a job, but he was a man of, of character and talent. So our distributor put him in the business. He sold Procter & Gamble products from his home, which is very typical in these rural areas. And at the end, he was kind of, he, and he's joked with me, he said, you know, this is great. He says, I'm the richest man in the village. Uh, I married one of the most beautiful women in the village. I now have a son, which of course is very important in that culture. He says, Bob, when are you gonna get my leg fixed? <laughs> so, you know, we can, we can work with governments around the world. We try to find uh, needs. I was telling a group earlier, we were the first company in the history of the world to get a permit to employ women in Saudi Arabia. This was a few years ago. Um, but we now have about 35 female employees in Saudi Arabia. It takes special steps to do that. We had to create a floor for the women in Saudi Arabia. We had to create meeting facilities so they could be on one side of the glass and men on the other. We have to pay for a guardian to go with the female employees on business trips because they don't, they're not allowed to travel by themselves. They can't drive. Um, so we work with governments, and when they're ready to change, we help them uh, change. I hope I answered your question. Uh, there was one back here, and I'm coming back. Yes, sir. Yeah, the, the decision's very easy. We bought the Oral-B business from Gillette in 2005. Oral-B was already the number one brush in the world. They had presence all over the world. We didn't have presence on Crest all over the world, so it was, it was a very uh, ROI, economically driven decision where they'd already established the brand name. And so now we're expanding Oral-B, um, Oral Care, you know, floss, brush, well, the brush is everywhere, um, paste, uh, rinse and so forth through Latin America, through Europe, through Africa. So that's why it already existed. Yes, ma'am. My pleasure. Yes, it is. Yeah, packaging is a big issue. Uh, sustainability in general is a big issue. I mean, just by the definition, you call the company a consumer goods company. Uh, by definition, it's, 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 um, it's a big area. 
So we've laid out our vision uh, for sustainability. Um, we want to power our plants with 100% renewable energy. We have plants that are now run by geothermal sources. We have plants, we have a plant in uh, the Netherlands that's run by a, um, a windmill. Uh, we want to use 100% renewable materials. So for an example, we have an arrangement with a startup company called LS9, where we're working to get carbon molecules from algae rather than petroleum. Um, we want to have zero consumer or manufacturing waste going to landfills. Right now, today, about 96% of what goes into our plant leaves in the product that leaves, but we'd like it to be 100%. We have about 18 plants now around the world. It's only 18 out of 150, so we have a way to go, where everything leaves the plant uh, for, some, for some ulterior use or for the product use. And then last but not least, we want to design products that are inherently better for the environment. One of my favorites is Tide Cold Water. I hope all of you use Tide Cold Water. I mean, if we could get everybody to turn down the temperatures of their washing machine, we would provide almost, well, above 4% of the Kyoto Protocol from the United States, just if we could do that. So there's lots of opportunity um, through science to reduce our footprint on the world. And frankly, I'm encouraged. Uh, as, as Jim said when he introduced me, I'm the chairman of the US-China Business Council. Last time I was in China, uh, meeting with the Chinese leadership, uh, what they said to me was, you got to help us figure out how to develop to where you are today, but not have the impact you had on the world, because the world can't do it. There's not enough oil, uh, and the world couldn't suffer the impact of 1.2 billion people doing what we did over the hundreds, hundreds of years since the, um, since the uh, Industrial Revolution. So leaders are aware. We, but we've got more work to do. Yes, sir. Uh, question was, uh, what's, what's my top priority or what's my mission? And secondly, what keeps me awake at night? My top role. My, my, my top role is very simple. This is a great company. This is the best company in the world I know of. It does well and it does good. It improves people's lives. It gives back to society. It does the right thing. Everybody I've worked with in this company for 32 years, uh, to me, lives up to the ideals I learned at West Point about duty, honor, country. I want to make sure this company is around more than another 175 years. So I want to do everything I can that the institution continues to thrive, which means we have to achieve those goals. We have to keep improving people's lives, and we have to keep rewarding our shareholders for owning our stock. So that's what I spend all my time doing. That's the headline. What do I spend a lot of time doing is finding and training the leaders of the future because I'm not going to be here all that long, right? So if you don't develop leaders, the, the succession plan, and you don't develop your leaders properly, you're not going to be here. I'm proud to say, although I'm humble in saying it, that we're, we were just awarded last week uh, the top company for the development of leaders by CEO Magazine. Second consecutive year, they've never done that before. Um, to me, that's one of the most important credits we can get because it's an independent research firm that does the work. So we spend a lot of time working on leaders. What keeps me up at night? Um, governments. Governments. They say they care about people, but oftentimes they don't behave like they care about people. And uh, I do everything I can to try to encourage them as much as I can. I was with uh, Shimon Perez in uh, Israel about uh, uh, November, I think. And he said to me, Bob, he said, um, countries are ungovernable. I want to pick my words carefully because I don't want to misquote him. He said, countries are ungovernable. And I, I see Shimon Perez as one of the wise men of the world, wise men and women of the world. I mean, when you think about the few people you'd like to have the dinner with some night, Lee Kuan Yew, Shimon Perez, Mother Teresa, I mean, you could have a great dinner, Henry Kissinger. <laughs> He said, countries are ungovernable. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, people, people's governments are naturally constrained by the borders of their country. 
and the issues that we have to face are borderless. And somehow we've got to get it to the point where we're all working together. And he said, when you look at the supernatural national organizations, the United Nations, IMF, World Bank, so forth, they really haven't provided that leadership that, um, that he was looking for. And he said, you know, I, I'm thinking as, as I look across companies, global companies are probably the ones who are more linear in addressing that need because I'm agnostic. I don't, I don't you know, yes, I'm an American, but uh, I, you know, I'm, I want to improve somebody's life. I don't really care what country they come from. And I'm going to do what I can, whatever country it is, in order to, excuse me, to help them. So um, he, he raised the issue, and I thought it was a, a very interesting issue uh, that he raised, and a, a real question. He's trying to develop uh, some, some organization to help this. But that's what I worry about. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, sure. Big issue. Big issue. Um, first of all, we've got to make the diaper smaller. Uh, more effective, but smaller. And today we're marketing a diaper which is 20% uh, thinner than its predecessor. Uh, and if you, look at, if you look at the diaper over a long period of time, it's 100% you know, smaller than it was, 1,000% smaller than it was in the beginning. So make it more effective. Also, see if we can fill it with renewable materials. You know, try to find materials that are renewable. And, and third, see if we can um, take the diaper back after its use and find some good use for the material. We have a pilot project going on right now in the Philippines where we're collecting the diapers back and then we're turning them into something useful like park benches or, or other things. And um, don't worry. <laughs> This is some time for Larry to stand up. Um, you know, so we, we realize that's an issue. And, uh, and obviously, with a brand that's $10 billion in sales, we can afford to make investments to learn how to do these things. Uh, and I think we can, we can get to the point um, where we do that. The other thing that's very important is you look at that, don't immediately conclude that the disposable diaper is worse on the environment than a cloth diaper. If you look at the entire life cycle of a cloth diaper, it's actually worse for the environment than the disposable diaper. But nevertheless, that's not an excuse. That's not a reason not to work on this. We are investing and we are working on it. I think I'm getting the hook, yep. but that's politely. Right. Thank you very much. So I just want to give a, a brief uh, word of thanks. Those of you who have taken my class know that will be very, very hard for me to do the brief uh, part. I, I would like to make a plug for myself first, though. If, if you're looking for someone to promote brawn, I bought my shaver in 1996, still using it nearly every day. I don't always come to work clean shaven, but I'm still go it's still going. I, I, I'm sorry, I can't help the advertisement. We're just introducing a new... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Glad to segue into that. We're introducing a new brawn. Uh, we started before Christmas. It's called Brawn Cool Tech. And uh, when you shave, it actually has technology that cools your skin uh, while you're shaving. So if you've been using the same razor for a long time, not only is your beard too, too rough, but you can have a better experience with Brawn Cool Tech. So, thank you. So, I, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sh uh, thrifty, but after about three cents a shave, I guess I could come out and finally, uh, finally up upgrade. Um, otherwise, I teach a course on international development, do a lot of research in this area, something that's uh, very near and dear to my heart. Started out in Indonesia, not too far away from the Philippines. One of the things we talk about in my class is that uh, some of the most basic problems have to do with uh, safe drinking water and hygiene. That one of the stats I give, in, in addition to the thousands of people that die every day from diarrheal diseases, is that for as little as an investment of $20 a day, you could save a year of someone's life, of productive life, um, 
just by providing soap for them to wash their hands with. Um, and then we get into the class, well, how do you do that? Right? How do we as individuals, as students, as professors, as business people, how do we uh, do that? And so for us, or for me as, a, uh, as an instructor who does a lot of time teaching, it's good to see that folks are working on that side of actually implementing and taking these problems head on. Now, unfortunately, we also end the class on the same note, similar note that Bob ended on that governments oftentimes stand in the way. So, you know, we're uh, glad to see that you're working on that side also because those are pretty big hurdles. Oftentimes we have the know-how, uh, but governments change a, a little more slowly than, say, businesses do. Um, so on behalf of the faculty, staff, students, friends, alumni here at Kenan Flagler, I wanted to thank Bob for sharing his time, energy with us today. And as a token of our appreciation, we're going to be making a donation to the children's, PNG's Children's Safe Water Drinking Fund so that we can be part of that, albeit a small part of the, the uh, goal of saving an hour every life uh, by 2020. We'll hope that over the years we'll hear progress reports and see us getting closer and closer uh, to meeting that goal. Um, to the audience, I'll also uh, just make a plug for the uh, UNC water theme. Uh, Bob mentioned it during his talk, and just to ask you to keep your eyes out for other events that are coming up, you can go to watertheme.unc.edu to find out about upcoming events. Thanks again, and thank you all for coming.